Hello, everybody. Um, very good to see you all. My name is Rupert Featherstone, director of the Hamilton Carr Institute, part of the Fitzwilliam Museum. And I'd like to welcome you to this Science in Art Day, which is the third we've organised, but the first under the auspices of the UCM, the University of Cambridge's Museums. And I know Joe McPhee's going to explain a little bit about their work and how we all fit together in a few minutes. So um, I'm not going to say very much, except to say it's very good to see you all here. There's a lot of old friends and some new faces from across the country, as a lot of people from Cambridge as well, of course. Um, we're trying to showcase what we do and also encourage new collaborations, give people ideas, hopefully let people network, discuss ideas, and who knows what will come out of it. So we, we love doing these sort of events. They are very, very good for the people presenting to show where they've got to. Some of this work is in progress um, to be published in the future. But it's also good to, see, to talk to our colleagues across the country and see how we can collaborate in the future. So I'm not going to say very much. I don't need to do all the health and safety stuff. I'm glad to say that will be Joe. Um, I do see that it says don't touch the polar bear, which I think is an important piece of advice wherever the polar bear is, not just in here. But apart from that, um, I hope you enjoy the day. It looks really stimulating. We'll have some good discussions later on. And I'll hand over to Joe. Right, so welcome, everybody. As Rupert said, uh, my name is Jo McPhee and I'm the Head of Programmes for the University of Cambridge Museums. So big thank you and welcome to you all for coming today and also a huge thank you to the Polar Museum for hosting us. So just to give you an overview of what's going to happen today, I'm going to start with a quick introduction to the University of Cambridge Museums. That will be followed by four speakers showing their insights and learning from recent and current projects. And then at 12.30 we're going to break for lunch and we've specifically scheduled a full hour for the lunch break to give you lots of time to meet and network with colleagues. And then after lunch, Charlotte Quadley, who is the curator here at the Polar Museum, is going to introduce their Polar Encounters exhibition, which hopefully you've already had a bit of a look at outside. After Charlotte, we've got a series of lightning talks, so really quick five minute fast post talks which will give you an overview of the work going on across the University of Cambridge Museums and collections. We'll then break for tea and our final session of the day is a panel discussion looking at digital futures. So huge amounts to cover in one day and I think it's going to be really interesting. So moving on to the University of Cambridge Museums. And I'm going to say from now on UCM, just because it's a bit easier and less words. So the UCM is a consortium of the eight university museums and the Botanic Garden, and we work in partnership with other collections across the university, so including the University Library, the Herbarium, New Hall Art Collection and others. We work together on a range of programmes focused on opening up our collections and the research which underpins them for a larger and more diverse audience. And our collections house several million objects spanning art and science and everything in between, as you can see from the um, names of the museums. All eight museums are accredited and five of them have designation status, which means that they hold collections of uh, national and international importance. So we are the second largest recipient in the country of Research England Museums and Galleries funding, and that's reliant on our contribution to the wider research environment. And as an Arts Council England Band 3 National Portfolio Organisation, we're committed to increasing access to our collections and engaging with our audiences. And these are just some of our other funders as well. So really funders, lots of different ones with lots of different priorities. This slide is really just to give you a bit of an overview of the scale of activity that happens across the collections. So last year we had over 1 million visitors across all of our venues. We engaged with nearly 7,000 research visitors and 34,000 school children. So quite large, lots going on. And by working collaboratively with colleagues within the consortium, the wider university, and also with varied external partners, we can share resources and expertise, which means we can care for our collections better, but also enhance the offer for our audiences. 
So these are just some of the areas where we work really collaboratively. We're going to hear lots about conservation and collections care today, so I'm not going to talk more about that. But I did just want to give you a couple of examples of collaboration from other areas of our activity. So the photo here, which I think is a lovely photo, hopefully you will agree, it's from our Dancing in the Museums project, which is a collaboration with the Council Independent Living Service. And that service supports older people who are at risk of isolation. And the project supports well-being and social interaction by engaging participants with objects and with each other through music and dance in the galleries. So here you can see a group of older people kind of responding through dance to one of the pictures in the Fitzwilliam <coughs> Museum. And we're also working collaboratively to explore and reinter reinterpret our diverse collections. So this is a poster advertising our Bridging Binaries project. It's been fully developed and is being delivered by a group of volunteer tour guides. And the tours will profile stories of non-conformative gender and sexual identities in four of our museums. And actually we have the first of our tours uh, starting tomorrow. So there'll be one here and there's one at the Museum of Zoology. So we're running a kind of pilot season for the next couple of months to see how they go and, and learn from, from them. We're keen to showcase the work that we do, both behind the scenes and in front of house, with as wide an audience as possible. And in the last year, we've delivered 13 Facebook live streams, which have received over 78,000 views. One of these provided the opportunity to see the Book of the Dead of Ramos at the Fitzwilliam Museum. And due to conservation concerns, the papyrus wasn't able to be on public display, so we only had it on public display for one day but we were really keen that as many people as possible could engage with it and could see it. And so through the Facebook live stream, we were able to reach a lot more people. And as university museums, we also have a role to play within the wider university. So we can support the university's contribution to society and its drive for equality and inclusivity. We can broaden student learning and raise aspirations through widening participation activity. And through research links, loans and exhibitions, we underpin the university's international profile. And of real importance to us is research. We're a key part of the research infrastructure landscape and have museum research active staff in many areas of cross-disciplinary activity. So that absolutely includes conservation and collections care, as we'll um, find out more about today. But again, I just wanted to let you know about a, a different project that also is, um, showcases our research. So this picture is from our nursery and residence project, which was a practitioner-led research project between the Botanic Garden, the Fitzwilliam Museum, and a local nursery and it explored creative learning for children in museum and garden settings. We also provide pathways to impact for all those we engage with, and we contribute to the research environment through those collaborations with non-academic partners. We enhance research value and impact through open access to collections and through loans and research collaborations. And research and impact is a real um, focus for us in the UC UCM at the moment and we have recently established a new research and impact working group with the intention of actually coming together and thinking about how we how we feel about research and how we showcase what we're doing and the first sort of event that that group is going to organize is a workshop in the new year for university researchers where we hope to encourage and embed collaborative working. And that's me. <laughs> Thank you. So, moving on to the kind of real content of the day and our first set of talks. And first up, Sophie. <laughs> so, Sophie's going to be speaking about the quest for an affordable method to identify plastics in collections. And Sophie has specialised in organic artefacts 
and more recently has worked on a mixed collection of 20th century objects here at the Polar Museum. She has wide-ranging conservation research interests, which are linked by the common theme of making the most of limited resources, which I think is something we can all associate with. It's lovely to see you all. Hello. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project which is still ongoing, very much, um, related to identifying plastics in our collections. So synthetic plastics of all kinds have become very commonplace in our everyday lives over the last 70 years, and that means they're also frequently found in museum collections. And their use is so widespread that they're actually seen in most types of artefacts from recent times. And the UCM collections are no exception. Um, across the eight university museum um, collections, the plastics are found in a very wide range of artefacts, including contemporary artworks, ethnographic objects, and particularly of interest to me is objects from the history of science and exploration. But because plastic pollution has become such a topical concern over the last couple of years, people sometimes assume that plastic objects last forever, um, but in fact they often are quite unstable and they deteriorate rapidly and catastrophically. And so ironically, it can actually be the most modern parts of your collection that are in the greatest danger of being lost. It's a growing problem for museums and there's still a lot of work needed to develop solutions and preserve the objects effectively. Am I doing this right? No, I'm not. That's it. So the word plastic is a catch-all term that actually covers a huge range of polymer-based materials. Objects made from plastic may be made from a large range of basic polymers, and more polymers are being developed all the time. The basic polymers are almost always modified by various additives, which can include fillers to bulk them out and make them cheaper, uh, colorants, antioxidants and stabilizers to lengthen their usable life, and plasticizers <coughs> to make them more flexible. So this picture shows some of the raw material colorant additives, which are used uh, in a small plastics factory called Bronmain Plastics, which is in Dorking. Um, and the number of possible combinations of polymer and additives is absolutely enormous, and so knowing exactly what an artefact is made from is pretty much impossible. So with so many variables, understanding plastic objects so that we can actually preserve them seems like a really daunting prospect. But deteriorating plastic in museums is a really real problem. I seem to be very bad at this. Sorry. <coughs> Perhaps I'll just use the old-fashioned method. It also doesn't work. That's better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here are some examples from the Polar Museum collection, um, where we estimate about 8% of the objects have got either, or either completely made from plastic or have plastic components. Um, so for example, on the top, the top two photographs show part of uh, an integrating motor pneumotachograph, also known as the IMP. Um, it was used for experiments in physiology and, and understanding how people respond <coughs> to very cold environments in the Commonwealth Antarctic uh, expedition of 1955-8. to eight. So on the right-hand side, you can see the sledging box that these, the piece of equipment actually goes in, and it's entirely lined with foam and it's disintegrated. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see uh, another part of the equipment, which has got about seven different plastics just in that one piece. Um, we've also got quite a lot of objects that are in their original packaging from expedition kit that was taken to the south or the north. Um, so on the left, you can see some cellophane-type packaging that's really not doing well at all. And, Packaging tends to be very vulnerable because it's so thin, rather like paper, it deteriorates very quickly. Um, and this pair of boots, are they're only 35 years old actually, these, um, but they are auto-destructing. That plastic is just pulling itself apart, and as you can see, there's some quite dramatic cracking going on. Um, so the Polar Museum is not the only museum affected by this. Uh, this is a rather wonderful lay It belongs to the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. This is actually an artwork made by, I'm going to read this out because I'm going to get it wrong, um, an artist uh, called Shigeyuki Kahara from New Zealand in 2005. Uh, Shigeyuki is a transgender artist that has a, a particular status in Samoan culture called Fa'afine. Um, and this is actually made from condoms strung together with plastic flowers and ribbons and so forth. And the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology is very actively collecting um, material. And um, one of the things that's an issue for their collection is that very often, because of the parts of the world they're collecting from, people are actually recycling plastic. So the plastic has had a use and started to deteriorate already before it's even made into the artifact, which is then collected and brought into the museum. So the UCM uh, 4C uh, Conservation and Collections Care Consultation Group were addressing the challenge of plastics across all of the collections. And our long-term aim is to identify and improve conditions for the objects in all the museums. 
So a group of conservators and collections managers from several of the museums who are most effective have been attending training courses, and we visited other institutions, including the Museum of London, the British Museum, the Science Museum, and the V&A, um, all with the aim of learning more about plastics conservation. And there's a general agreement that although there are numerous types of plastic in museums, there are really just five which cause particular problems for conservators, and they are these ones, cellulose nitrate, cellulose acetate, polyurethane, PVC, and rubber. And the good news is that if you give them the right storage environment, it's possible to slow down their deterioration using one or other of these storage options. Um, so freezing, ventilating, going oxygen-free, sealing in an airtight container or putting them into a buffering container. But because all the polymers are different, they deteriorate in different ways, and so they have different storage needs. So in some cases, if you put a plastic object in the wrong kind of storage, um, you're actually going to speed up the deterioration. So an example of that would be polyvinyl chloride, which tends to decay by loss of plasticizer. If you seal it in an airtight container, that completely slows down the evaporation that, that draws the plasticizer out. But if, on the other hand, you were putting it in well-ventilated storage, you'd actually be speeding everything up. Whereas cellulose nitrate, which is quite famous for giving out nitric acid, and clearly that's damaging both for the artifact itself and for things around it, um, that needs plenty of ventilation and ideally freezing. But if you were to seal that into an airtight container, you would be concentrating your nitric acid atmosphere and that would actually speed things up. So it's very obvious that understanding exactly what you have and identifying it is absolutely crucial to figuring out the right thing to do. Both to identify, have you got objects that are at high risk in the first place? And then how are you going to treat them? So identifying plastics at the moment is uh, something where you've really only got two choices. You have traditional non-analytical techniques um, and then you have instrumental analysis, which is very expensive, and it's out of the question for most museums. So there is actually a great deal that you can learn about plastics through traditional methods of examining them. Um, this is Yvonne Shashua from the National Museum of Denmark. She's a, a well-known plastics expert, and she's demonstrating sniffing <laughs> plastics. She's got a deteriorating shoe from the Bose Museum collection. And by using touch and smell and vision and then combining it with information you might have about provenance, maybe even patent numbers that you would find on objects, uh, you can often guess your way to a pretty good at identification. Um, another traditional <coughs> method for identifying plastics, which was popular in the past, is um, burning bits of them. And you put tiny samples on the end of a pin and you set fire to them. And then you have to characterise the brightness of the flame, its smokiness, the smell of it. Um, and other things like that. Um, so this is UCM conservator Kirsty Williams having a go. We were at the West Dean Pla Conservation of Plastics course, and it is brilliant fun. It really is. But I don't know a single conservator that would be willing to do this on an accessioned object. Um, <laughs> and it's not just because it's destructive, but it's also incredibly subjective. So you take your sample, and the thing goes flash, and you have to, oh, what was that flame? And does it smell? How does it smell? Does it smell different from burnt plastic or not? And it's it's really really difficult. To get, it, to get anything out of it, really. And the only time where it works is with, uh, on the left, you can see this long-suffering troll who's had lots of pieces taken off. He's made of PVC, and PVC gives you this very obvious green flame. So that's un, you know, it's irrefutable, and that's easy to see, but all the rest of them, very, very difficult to do. So the VNA have been working on a sort of decision tree <coughs> technique um, for identifying plastic using only non-destructive and non-instrumental methods, so no burning involved. Um, so this was a team of Brenda Keenahan, and she had a postgraduate um, intern called Karen van Ordel from the Netherlands, and they developed this technique, and they based it on an earlier decision tree that had been developed by the Museum of Design in Plastics in Bournemouth. Um, so a lot of the early work on conservation of plastics has been done um, relating to artworks and contemporary design, and it's actually been funded by insurance companies because the value of those objects is quite high. Um, but actually, the range of plastics that's used in those contexts isn't in quite the same as what you find in industrial or scientific heritage or domestic heritage. So I really welcomed the fact that the V&A were focusing very much on domestic plastics, and you can see that from this collection. They are responsible for the Museum of Childhood in Bethnal Green, and so they've got a very particular <coughs> interest in things that you find in households. So this is a sample page from the V&A's decision tree. I'm sorry, the top has been chopped off. It's, um, it's basically a, a set of 12 questions, and as you go through them, you narrow down what it is that it, you might have. Um, but unfortunately, I think all of these non-instrumental methods for identifying plastic are very subjective, and um, it is difficult to get the right answer. So even the people who, like Yvonne, Brenda, and Carrion, who've been working on these kinds of materials 
um, for a very long time and have got very used to working out what plastics is, they have quite a high margin of error of between 10 and 20% by their own admission. And for most conservators, we're a lot less accurate than that. Um, and so when we've tried this out amongst us, even people who've thought a bit about plastics, we're getting it wrong a lot. And I think we feel very uncomfortable with making quite important decisions about how to handle something based on that level of accuracy. So the alternative to identifying plastics empirically is using instrumental analysis. And the most widespread and um, accepted technique for this is Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, which I'm going to call FTIR. It's excellent. It's very reliable. It has a really wide detection range, so it's capable of identifying many basic polymers and also sometimes additives, degradation products, and even there have been instances where it's been able to identify materials that were used in connection with an artefact, like scent that's been in a handbag or something like that. So FTIR does provide the gold standard, um, but unfortunately it's a very expensive item of equipment and it's only available in a large or well-resourced institution. So at UCM we wanted to see if we can find an alternative that's going to be both reliable and also much more affordable, because deteriorating plastics are found in museums of every size and they need to be addressed. So some background research showed that um, Near-infrared spectrometers are used for sorting plastics in recycling plants. Um, this is actually our local recycling centre at Waterbeach. We go to every length to cover all the bases. And the, the smell of this place is astonishing, but it's a really, really interesting experience. I encourage you to go to your local dump. It's fascinating. Um, and so they've done a, a recycling um, scientists have done an awful lot of work on plastic identification and published that. Um, so the range of plastics that you find in recycling bins isn't exactly the same as the range that you see in museums, but it still seemed like quite a promising avenue to explore. Uh, and the other thing that's of interest at this point is that near-infrared sensors have become much, much cheaper in recent times. And so you can also now um, get some small handheld devices. And the other great thing is that Paula at F uh, Fitzwilliam Museum, who you're going to hear from later, has a fantastic FTIR machine, which we're able to use to validate the work as we go along. So we decided to test a small commercial handheld um, near-infrared spectrometer, which is called a SCIO. And we also decided to test a uh, fibre optic reflectance spectrometer, which is available at the Fitzwilliam Museum. So FORS, I'm going to call that one FORS, fibre optic reflectance spectrometer. FORS isn't really a cheap alternative to FTIR. But on the other hand, the uh, spectra are much more easily read by anybody who's not a specialist. And the other thing is that it's much more practical in terms of taking samples of real artefacts. Um, so in that respect, it's a much more accessible machine for a non-specialist. Um, the Fitzwilliam Museum has got a FORS machine already, and so it would be advantageous for us to develop another application for it, bearing in mind that we've got long-term goals to try and improve conditions for all the plastics across this university uh, museum consortium. The FORS data will actually also be very helpful to us in drawing up a specification for an affordable device, because it will show whether there are diagnostic features in the spectra um, in the range 750 to 2,500 nanometers. So we had two sets of reference samples which had previously been identified by the v &A Museum using their FTIR machine. Um, and they, this contains examples of all the problem plastics and then a few others that are very commonly found. Um, so this picture just shows one of those sets. We have another one very similar. And we devised a series of experiments which are intended to show whether either the FORS or the SCIO are actually reliably able to identify the plastics. So I'm afraid I try very hard not to have text on slides, but I'm afraid we've got some text now. Um, which you can't probably easily read either. <laughs> Experiment one, so we establish signal variants for typical objects. What this basically means is that spectra from different places in any sample, particularly in a museum, are going to vary slightly according to quite a lot of factors. Um, and that will be down to deterioration, surface texture, dirt, and um, perhaps also variations in the angle in which you take your, your reading. So we've been taking 10 spectra off any given sample from different places um, to establish how much variation in that spectrum is normal for that particular sample. And so the spectra gathered in that experiment um, form the basis of the spectral library, which is then going to be used for comparing everything else to. So in experiment two, we remeasured the exact same samples again, 10 times in lots of different places, and we checked whether the machine could still recognize them, which might sound really basic, but if the machine can't already recognize something it's been trained to recognize, then you've sort of fallen at the first hurdle. Um, so then in experiment three, we <coughs> analysed another set of the same reference samples, so the other group of those ones that we looked at before, um, and they had also been identified by FTIR in the VNA, and they, we just did exactly the same protocol again, and that was to provide cross-validation. So again, they're almost identical samples. The information we have about them comes from the same source. 
um, and then we're just sort of gradually extending, extending, extending the, the sort of confidence that you have that the machine can continue to identify correctly. So in, in experiment four, we then had a different set of samples representing a lot of the same plastics, but from Durham, and they had been identified using a diff different FTIR machine, and so they were another reference collection, and then we were using it to validate from so-called out of sample. And then in experiment five, we finally got on to having a look at unknown plastics from the UCM collections to see if we could actually get some identifications from that. And we, as well as looking at plastics, we also laid down some reference spectra for materials that are quite often confused with plastic, either in, because you think they are or they aren't, things like bone, ivory, amber, um, some antler and some tortoise shell. A lot of this work was carried out for us by Dipika Nadkarni. She is a master's student, or was a master's student, from the University of Durham Conservation Programme, and she was working at UCM on a student placement as part of her degree earlier this year. So as mentioned, um, we were well, using an FTIR machine, a Bruca FTIR machine for reference. This is Dipika. Um, and she is at the moment doing some uh, analysis of it in attenuated total reflectance mode. And that's the mode that's used by research scientists when they're studying plastics. Um, it illustrates a major disadvantage of this from a conservation point of view, um, because the artifact has to be placed in the sampling area and then clamped down into place. So the actual measurement is being taken from below, and then that funny sort of metal thing is coming down and holding the object in place. So this was a pencil topper from it. It's just got such expressive eyebrows. Um, <laughs> and he's really tiny. He's a pencil topper. Um, and one couldn't really have fitted anything any bigger than him into this sampling area. And we had a lot of difficulty getting a sample, a spectrum from him, or any kind of reading, because he's such a peculiar shape. Um, and actually, we ended up having to chop a piece off. I'm really sorry to tell you. Uh, <laughs> in order to get a usable spectrum from him. So that example also shows that even if you don't have to chop a piece off your sample, that clamping technique can still cause damage. I think you can probably see there's a great sort of dent in this piece of fake leather. Um, so it is possible to use the FTIR machine in external beam mode, which means that you can have a sensor on the side of the machine and you can appose your artifact to it. Um, the difficulty with that is that it's, you then get a much more messy spectrum and it's very difficult to interpret. So again, it's becoming quite inaccessible for people who are non-specialists, and especially if you have curved or rough surfaces. Um, it's also, when you're dealing with a machine that's worth many tens of thousands of pounds, rather worrying to sort of be manhandling it around and sort of stick, you know, putting it up against something big and unwieldy. So it's, it's not ideal from that point of view. Um, so now I'd like to talk a bit about the SCIO, which is the handheld uh, near-infrared spectrometer. So we were very kindly lent the SCIO by Nicholas Burnett at Museum Conservation Services in Duxford. Um, it's, in its basic form, it costs about £300, um, and it works on an app. Um, and it's marketed um, from the company called Consumer <coughs> Physics as a device for uh, analysing nutritional content in food and pharmaceuticals, so you could go around a market and choose the sweetest apples or check the active ingredients in some painkillers that you bought on the internet and make sure they are what they say they are. Or um, they're quite keen on telling you this and it's been lost, but it says that you can check the content of your marijuana. <laughs> so just saying, that's how they're marketing this. I'm not commenting. Um, <laughs> it's got a really narrow spectral range. It only measures between 700 and 1100 nanometers. And so there was quite a high likelihood that we weren't going to get very much out of it, um, but I have to say I was really excited that this technology is available at such a low cost, and so I was really keen to try it out. Um, it's very small, it's easy to use, um, and you basically, um, it looks as if it would be quite practical for gathering the spectra off an artifact because you just hold it up to something and you press that, that big white button there. You calibrate it out of this funny little sort of fitting thing at the end, but it's actually got a white plate in the bottom and a lot of reflective around the edge, and, and that gives you the calibration, and then you just fire at the artifact. Um, so the SCIO has got preloaded references for food, and um, <laughs> Dipika tried it on some chocolate, and then worried about the fact she didn't quite agree. In fact, she was getting more cocoa content than she thought, and slightly more <laughs> calories and that kind of thing. But it's got, it's got a preloaded software for that, but obviously not for museum plastics, but it does allow you to build applets, so you can train it to recognize things. Um, and so it looked as if we were going to be able to work through those experiments, as I mentioned before, um, and build a reference library, but as soon as we started doing it, we quite quickly ran into difficulties. So um, this is one of the difficulties with it, is it, because it's an app, you can only get this information as screenshots. So these are screenshots from it, but you can't download that information anywhere. 
And so that's a challenge in itself, but don't, we can worry about that later. Um, it only really wants to do three scans of anything. And so if you do six scans, it starts um, complaining. <laughs> oh, you know, do you want to refer to the instructions? Six scans, that's too many. Which, of course, we were doggedly doing ten because that's what we said we'd do in our protocol. So we went, <laughs> it's not really a problem, but it's quite interesting. Um, so then more of a problem was that um, as soon as you actually had more than two substances in your applet, so if you start to train it on various different references and put it into this, all into the same applet, it gets very confused. And this is an, an example where it was trying to identify cellulose acetate, actually a piece of cellulose acetate it looked at already. And it didn't, oh, I can't, I don't know what that is, but it has got it in there. It is one of those spectra. Um, and it's, it, so it's, it's not managing to recognise things that it should already know about. Um, another problem is that there are no units of um, measurement in the display at all. So you can't tell what that wavelength is. You can't see anything. And if you put something into it that's radically different, so if I were, for example, to scan some polyurethane into that, which has got an enormous peak somewhere, all of these would suddenly look really, really flat. So it's rescaling things, and you don't quite know. It's a, making comparisons between things is very, very difficult. Um, so the only way that you could actually build a spectral library would be to compare a plastic with applets where you'd made an applet for each given um, plastic. But you're only allowed to have 10 applets, so that also cuts it off a bit. So we tested a lot of combinations of things, and we were getting both false positives and false negative results, and uh, it meant that we just lost faith. Um, and then, of course, we have this difficulty of sharing the information. So in short, I would say the SCIO is, you know, it's great fun as a consumer toy, but it's not a useful tool for this, I'm really sorry to say. This has been a very useful experience for us, though, because I think it's pointed out an awful lot of issues about software, um, and certainly in terms of specifying a machine that we might want to try and build ourselves, because we're sort of at the point of thinking that we might have to do that. Um, it's a really useful experience to see what works, what do we need, what, you know, it's, it's really pointed out a lot of pitfalls, which is useful. So now looking at fours, this is Dipika um, analysing using the fours machine that is at the Fitzwilliam Museum, which has a probe. And as you can see, this is, again, a very easy way of analysing off artefacts, and I know Paolo can talk about that in a lot more detail. Um, so we were also very lucky to be lent uh, another FORS machine. This is a quality tech spec, um, and it was lent to us by the Alexander Gertz programme, which is run by Mulvan Panalytical in the USA. They have a sort of student support programme where they lend pieces of equipment out for people to try things. And uh, so Dipika is having a go here. She's looking at our weasel tractor, which is downstairs. It's got a, a plastic seat and also a plastic windscreen. Um, and here she's looking at a digital optical module dual, which has got plastics which are very sort of thin. And this, again, performed really well. It does look rather amusing. It sort of reminds me of a bit of a Lego ray gun or something. But actually, and the display is on the back. But it's actually very, very practical. And it's intended for people climbing around on mountains and things and taking geological readings. Um, so the biggest difficulty with both of the FORS machines has been in analysing either black or transparent plastics. And that's something that's pointed out in the literature as... Um, a known problem um, and it looks as though analyzing things in the mid infrared is actually much better and much less likely to have an issue either with black or translucency but unfortunately mid infrared sensors are still really expensive so we're working with the data that we've gathered at the moment to get determine if there are any diagnostic features in the near infrared range for identifying just the main problem plastics and we're focusing entirely on those uh, cellulose nitrate cellulose acetate pvc polyurethane and rubber and if there are, we're going to use that data to help draw up a specification for building an inexpensive device. And when we are, get to that stage, we'll be working in partnership with someone else in the university, either Department of Engineering or maybe Department of Material Science. So this is very much still a work in progress, um, but we've already had an enormous amount of support from colleagues uh, and help uh, from people in other institutions, and I'd like to thank all of them. Uh, thank you, and thank you as well for listening. on the use of copper sulphate in 16th century Flemish art. And Paula is the Fitzwilliam Museum's first and only research scientist. Her main research interests include the technical analysis of cultural heritage objects, and particularly with non-invasive analytical methods. Also the study of artist materials and techniques, and the transfer of knowledge between artists 
and craftsmen working in different media. So over to you. Thank you, Joe. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to see everybody here. And it's, it's actually great, although slightly daunting, to be talking about um, a topic which I've been researching sir, sort of on and off for um, the past seven years. And to begin with, um, I want to highlight the slight difference between the title announced in the programme, Reflections on the Use of Copper Sulfates, and the topic of my presentation today, which um, is actually going to focus on the identification of copper sulfates in 16th century Flemish art and beyond. These um, reflections originated largely um, from an article I co-authored with um, Dr. Giulia Bertolotti, who's here today, and which is just about to appear in the second volume of the Manuscripts in the Making um, conference proceedings. Um, but I also owe a great deal to the long-term programme of technical examination of Netherlandish school paintings carried out over the past 20 years or so at the National Gallery in London, whose results were most recently summarised in a paper by Marika Spring, who's also here today. Um, however, I, I will incorporate further research carried out both here and elsewhere um, in the materials used by panel painters, limners and manuscript illuminators, working not only in northern continental Europe, but also in England and Italy. <coughs> the identification of copper sulphates used as green pigments in easel paintings and illuminated manuscripts is often described in the literature as tentative or an unusual finding. And many authors remark on the lack of specific re recipes in historic treatises. Others hypothesize that copper sulfates may be simply a degradation product um, of synthetic malachite, which is often identified in the same areas. And such um, cautious approaches um, belie the fact that green copper sulfates have been now securely identified in an increasingly number of artworks, um, the majority of which were created in Flanders during the 15th and the 16th century. Um, a series of copper sulfate and hydroxide sulfates um, are known to exist, of which some at least appear to have been used in a pigment context. Those most commonly identified in artworks are brocantite and posniakite, but occasionally um, the closely related amphorite, calcantite, and lungite have also been reported. Brocantite is a green copper sulfate hydroxide. Um, it is a secondary mineral found in weathering zones of copper deposits, particularly in arid climates. It is a relatively common mineral, um, which is found worldwide in areas such as Cornwall and Derbyshire in England, as well as sites in Morocco, um, Namibia, Australia, and Chile. It is often found in association with other copper sulfates, to which is closely related chemically, but also with copper carbonates and copper chloride hydroxides. Posniakite, the second of these two um, minerals, is a copper sulfate hydroxide hydrate mineral. Um, so basically, essentially, a hydrated form of brocantite. It is known from areas um, such as Saxony in Germany, Alsace in France, as well as Norway, Greece, and many more. As I've already noted, the cautious approaches to the identification of this type of minerals um, found in the literature belie the fact that this category of pigments have been identified in a significant number of artworks. And scholars have rightly suggested that copper sulfates may have often escaped identification due to the fact that very specific analytical methods are needed in order to discriminate between them and the other copper-based pigments one usually finds um, chiefly other greens, such as verdigris and malachite, but also asherite blue. This is especially true, obviously, in the case of illuminated manuscripts, which in the vast majority of cases are analysed using non-invasive, um, so sample-free methods. For example, in all instances where green copper sulphates were found to have been used in 16th century Netherlandish paintings at the National Gallery, their identification was based on the analysis of samples by SCMEDX, MicroRamen, or MicroFTIR in various configurations. On the other hand, um, the two methods which historically have been used more often for the analysis of manuscripts are the non-invasive equivalents of these, um, that is XRF and Raman spectroscopy mostly. However, XRF cannot be used to reliably distinguish copper sulfates from other copper-based pigments. The low energy characteristic peaks of sulfur can often be too weak 
for identification when high um, excitation voltages are used. And even in the appropriate experimental conditions, um, the position of these sulfur peaks overlaps with the peaks for lead, which is contained in numerous pigments, um, including the lead and yellow often mixed with um, copper-based greens, um, and is usually found almost ubiquitously in manuscripts anyway, in, in the form of lead white in various mixtures. <coughs> With its ability to detect the molecular signature of materials, Raman spectroscopy, um, on the other hand, is at least theoretically well suited to the identification of individual sulfates. And reference Raman spectra of a number of copper sulfates have been published, um, and you see some of them here on this slide, um, spectra B and C are reference spectra, for example. However, this technique's ability to discriminate amongst the copper sulfates with the low laser powers which must be employed in order to avoid damage to manuscripts is a matter of debate. Some authors, including Deborah Meyer and her colleagues, um, have found that Raman analysis carried out with a 532 nanometer laser at relatively low power is successful in distinguishing copper sulfate from other copper based screens and um, occasionally even in discriminating among the different types of copper sulfates. On the other hand, um, <coughs> other authors such as Chiara Zafino and her colleagues in 2015 could not distinguish between postnyakite and brokantite with the Raman instrument they employed. These contrasting results are likely due to different instrumental setups, different laser powers used, and might also have been influenced by the type and amount of paint binders present in the samples they were analysing. As the availability of non-invasive and portable instrumentation increases, additional methods are starting to be used for the analysis of manuscripts and have shown potential for the non-invasive identification of copper sulfates. For example, the spread of relatively inexpensive portable equipment to perform FTIR spectroscopy, which Sophie mentioned earlier, um, in external reflection, so without the need to press down on the sample, but being able to just get the, the sample or the object close to the instrument. Um, this has resulted in a growing number of publications describing its effective use to identify paint binders and pigments, including copper sulfates and other copper-based greens, on illuminated manuscript fragments. And I say fragments because, as Sophie said, the, the most commonly used FTIR, um, portable FTIR instrument kind of bulky and getting it close to a book is not the easiest thing to do. It can be done, but it's a bit of a setup challenge. Reflection infrared spectra often extend into the region above 4,000 centimeters minus one, um, which, is, which means below 2.5 microns. Um, and this region can also be probed using reflectance spectrometers operating in the UV, visible, and near-infrared range, so the force <coughs> instrument, which again Sophie mentioned earlier. What you see in, in this table is a compilation of spectral features detected by various authors using FTIR systems, um, but looking into the, sort of the near-infrared range. Um, so they've been converted here from centimeters minus one to nanometers, so they can be more easily compared with the features identified in the force spectrum. A force instrument um, is the one we use at the Fitzwilliam Museum to analyse a series of six full-page miniatures from the hours of Albrecht of Brandenburg, illuminated by Simon Benning and his workshop in 1522-1523 for Cardinal Albrecht of Brandenburg. The Annunciation, which you see here, opened the hours of the Virgin in the volume, and you see the Virgin and the Angel depicted in a detailed interior with a single source of light um, providing three-dimensionality and texture um, to the architectural background and to Gabriel and the Virgin's um, draperies. And then there's an added feature in the border. Um, you see the Virgin accompanied by an angel on her way to visit Elizabeth in a luscious landscape which is dominated by a range of green hues. Now this great range of green hues um, appears to have been obtained with a variety of copper-based pigments. And if you look at the fours, um, spectrum here, which um, is just an example from one of the green areas, but most of the ones we collected look um, a lot like this. Um, they consistently show absorption bands in um, 
for recognizable positions. The other bounds I haven't marked up are the ones that are due mostly to the parchment support, so they're not relevant to identify <coughs> the pigment. Um, and and these, the position of these bands suggests the presence of one or more copper sulfates. Now, the first band at 1439 can't really be used for um, identification of specific sulfates um, without a good reference um, spectra. And to our knowledge, the published reference spectra of copper sulfates obtained usually with FTIR instruments don't include that band because FTIR doesn't really get to that range. <coughs> um, but the other bands we observe. Um, appear to indicate the presence of bosniakite in um, this case, um, whereas the, the band at 2340 is slightly more um, characteristic of brockantite. So we're looking probably at a mixture of copper sulfates. In, in some areas, there's an additional spectral band around 2214, 2216 nanometers, which suggests the possible additional presence of malachite as well. And we're very fortunate um, when we were doing this work, because um, we had the possibility to further investigate this and some other of the Benning miniatures with X-ray diffraction, thanks to our collaboration with the Landis lab in Catania, Italy, who brought their equipment over here. Um, an XOD, which is usually carried on samples removed from paintings and manuscripts, has been shown to be successful in identifying malachite and copper sulfates, um, although it sometimes failed to identify verdigris. The XRD patterns obtained from illuminated <coughs> manuscript samples are often B poor or dominated by amorphous faces, often make identification difficult. Um, but the results we obtain on this non invasive um, XRD, um, with this non invasive XRD instrument, um, were actually most promising, as you can see here. Um, and in the case of the this annunciation, the results um, support the identification of a sulfate and a carbonate of copper specifically bosniakite and malachite, both present together in the same paint passages. An XOD um, analysis also allowed us to identify quartz, the possible presence of which we had been able to hypothesize um, upon observing peaks for silicon in the extra spectra, though obviously we couldn't prove that it, it was quartz. And quartz and other aluminum silicate minerals have been found um, often, for example, at the National Gallery, in green passages containing both malachite and copper sulfates in works by late 15th and early 16th century Netherlandish easel painters. The combined pres presence of all these mineral faces, so malachite, copper sulfates, and quartz, is most likely due to the use of a pigment, which is traditionally called mountain green. The challenges, which are usually encountered by scientists to securely, um, non-invasively identify green copper sulfates, justify the notion that these compounds can really only be included in an artist's palette after comprehensive examination based on the results um, of multiple analytical techniques, as was the case for the Benning um, miniatures we studied. For example, there's a, there's a statement by Nancy Turner, um, who analyzed um, another prayer book by Simon Benning, illuminated for the same cardinal at the Getty. Um, and it, based on XRF analysis alone, she identified the presence of a copper-based green. And it's highly likely that this material would also be found to contain copper sulfates if further investigated with additional methods. Now, I don't, I don't have the time and I don't want to um, give you a comprehensive review of instances in which copper sulfates have been securely identified in works of art. Um, but it is clear, based on a significant number of published case studies, um, that the identification of green copper sulfates can really hardly be described as unusual any longer, especially in certain geographic and chronological contexts. During the past 30 years, the copper sulfates, posnakite and brockantite, have been securely identified by several research teams in numerous 15th and 16th century manuscripts, um, and easel paintings illuminated in Flanders and the neighboring regions. Um, now, what you see on the bottom of this slide, however, is a slightly different type of artwork. It's a cabinet miniature painted on parchment by Isaac Oliver, a renowned limner or painter of chiefly portrait miniatures. French born, but working in London, Oliver achieved a subtle nuanced green color of this um, landscape using not just malachite, but also brockantite, 
applied in separate paint passages rather than mixed with malachite in the same areas. Now, why do I mention Oliver, a French artist working in England, in the context of the apparent preference for green copper sulfates on the part of Netherlandish artists? Isaac Oliver was a highly versatile artist um, whose artistic scope and technical range is quite hard to establish. And this is not least because, disappointingly, and unlike his presumed teacher, Nicholas Hilliard, considered to be the best limner working at the <coughs> Tudor and Stuart Court, Oliver is not known to have produced any written documentation about his life and his practice. Nicholas Hilliard, however, never engaged in landscape painting on this scale, preferring to work on portraits. And so although we know very little about Isaac Oliver's training, and although he's presumably Hilliard's pupil, it, is, it seems quite evident that his ability to paint a landscape um, like this does not come from Hilliard. There is a um, great deal of disagreement as to whether Oliver travelled at some point during his life to the Low Countries or to France. Um, we only know that he did go to Venice from a, a miniature he painted there, which was actually signed and inscribed in Venezia, Fecit is at Oliviero Francese, E.O., in uh, 1596, it's dated. So as part of a small um, pilot research project in which I'm currently engaged with my colleague Christine Kimbrell, Senior Paintings Conservator at the Hamilton Carr Institute, we have recently analysed two more cabinet miniatures painted by Oliver, one at the Staffens Museum for Kunst in Copenhagen and one at the National Portrait Gallery in London. And both of these miniatures, as you can see, include um, landscapes with green passages. In both cases, the analysis have confirmed Oliver's use of copper sulfates in addition to malachite in his landscapes and so appear to support the material evidence gathered so far about his possible early training and influence, which currently points beyond England and beyond Oliver's native country of France, towards the illuminator's trade in Flanders or towards Flemish artists working in London at the time. And in the hope of shedding a bit more light on this matter, Christine and I plan to analyse a small landscape painted on a piece of parchment of the exact shape and size suitable for a portrait miniature in the collection of Burley House and currently attributed to a 17th century Flemish artist. Now I've played a bit with Photoshop here um, to show you portions of landscape from two of the Oliver miniatures I showed earlier, um, as they would appear in the same format. And you see them here on the right. Um, we see significant similarities in colour and technique and I'll hope to confirm these visual um, observations under the microscope and with the aid of some spectroscopic results. The repeated um, identification of copper sulfates and their associated minerals in manuscripts and paintings produced mostly in Flanders, as well as Italy, for which I've shown no examples today, might be linked to the existence of localised natural deposits of these minerals, such as those documented in the Ardennes and Tuscany. It's also possible, however, that mountain green was traded as a pigment along the same routes as metallic copper. Such a hypothesis is not unrealistic, given the likely association between the pigments production and copper mining. Thinking of Benning, for example, working in Bruges, we know that copper reached Bruges, uh, reached Bruges from a number of European regions from at least the early 13th century and until 1450. And then in the mid-1460s, South German merchants started instead to export copper to Antwerp, a factor which is thought to have contributed to the city's rise in importance with respect to Bruges. However, mountain green would um, probably still easily have been available in Bruges via Antwerp, where Benning was active there um, in the early 16th century. And Bruges is also the likely place of origin of the Fitzwilliam Book of Hours, a stunning early 16th century manuscript, which we've researched in some depth over the past couple of years. The sumptuous illustrations of this manuscript have long been recognised by scholars as the collaborative effort of four highly accomplished artists working with some assistants. And the recent analysis has um, confirmed the overall homogeneity of the artist's rich and colourful palette, but they've also identified small but significant differences, which help support the attribution of individual images to a certain artist. I'm not going to discuss um, these recent discoveries in depth. Are they, um, they are the subject of an essay, which is just about to be published. But I will mention individual pigments, starting with copper sulfates, 
which make this manuscript um, a great example of how technical and material analysis informs our understanding of an object's context and of the existing exchanges between artists working in different media. A green copper sulfate was detected exclusively in miniatures by the so-called painter of additional 15677, who illuminated the majority of this manuscript. And once again, it was, um, the copper sulfate was clearly identified using reflectance spectroscopy in the UV, vis, and near infrared range. And once again, these green areas were also found to contain silicates. A purple dye, also used by the same artist alone, reminds us that um, since the 13th century, Bruges had been a leading centre of Berlin textile production, where a range of dyes would have been easily available. And a connection with other local crafts might be suggested by the identification of a clay-rich ochre in yellow and orange areas painted by several of the Fitzwilliam Irish artists. This material may well be, quote, the red colour that is found at Antwerp in the new bricks, end quote, samples of which were sent by the painter and glass painter Dirk Thurle to Durer, and which Durer then purchased for, purchased for himself. This would presumably have been a reddish earth of an attractive hue, probably containing high amounts of clay minerals, which are one of the fundamental components of all ceramic materials. The crystal globe that you see here, and it's held by Christ in that image of the Salvatore Mundi you saw earlier, um, has silver highlights which appear bright on the left side, but very dark, as if tarnished, on the right side. This looks like it must have been an intentional effect aimed at conveying the three-dimensionality of the sphere and also its optical qualities. Um, and it's still unclear to us how the effect was obtained, as the main difference we could identify between the bright silver and the dark silver area is a much higher silicon content in the former. Um, we're, again, we're not entirely sure what the materials used are, but should we look into contemporary metal or, or jewellery making practice in order to uncover the secrets of this technique? And finally, the striking image of the peacock feathers, which faces the Salvator Mundi, has been rendered with complex mixtures and layers of a number of pigments, including red lead, malachite, lead white, shell gold and earth pigments. The bright blue centres of the feathers were painted with smalt. An X-ray analysis reveals that the cobalt in the smalt, identified on this page, contains high amounts of iron and arsenic impurities. Now, the use of this specific type of cobalt is associated with ores in Saxony from the 16th to the 18th century. Now, interestingly, um, this is the only occurrence of smalt identified so far in this manuscript on which we've analysed at least 12 large miniatures and a few other pages. So does its presence indicate a contribution by a fifth artist, in addition to the four already identified by scholars, um, artists undetected until now and as yet unidentified? And does his preference for smalt, a glass-based material, tell us something about the artistic community within which he moved? What other secrets about the community of people involved with the production of this and other beautiful objects can our technical analysis reveal? Thank you. So next up we've got Adele Wright, who will be talking about investigating the making of landscape oil sketches in the 18th and 19th centuries. And Adele has wide-ranging experience as a painting conservator at the National Maritime Museum, Tate Modern and British Museum. Her research interests include the ethics of various approaches to conservation, investigation of artist materials and techniques, as well as the connections between conservation, artist practice, and the wider context of material culture. Thanks very much for that introduction. Can everyone hear me? Does that work? Okay. Um, so I began investigating um, the making of landscape oil sketches in the 18th and 19th centuries um, a few months ago when I started at the Hamilton Car Institute. So it definitely hasn't been years worth of work like other people's presentations. Um, this is very much a work in progress and it's related to a project that Jane Munro um, instigated for the Fitzwilliam Museum. She wanted uh, the Hamilton Car Institute to look at some of the Fitzwilliam Museum's landscape oil sketches um, in order to get some a bit more technical information to enrich the upcoming exhibition 
which will be uh, co-curated by the Fitzwilliam Museum, the National Gallery of Art uh, in Washington, and the Fondation Custodia in Paris. It will open in Cambridge in autumn 2020. Um, so, these are the first eight paintings that um, I've received from the Fitzwilliam Museum to have a look at. Um, I've shown them here roughly in chronological order, and you can see they're by artists from several different European countries. Um, these are all examples of oil sketching from nature, a practice that has existed at least since the early 17th century, when François Desportes made oil sketches of landscapes on paper en plein air, which means he was working out in nature in the open air. There are several reasons why artists would have chosen to make landscape sketches such as these. For example, in the 18th and 19th centuries, making landscape oil sketches or making oil sketches in general was a traditional part of uh, training in the academies in France and England. They also may have been making sketches in order to record individual motifs in the landscapes that they could then bring back to their studios and incorporate into uh, finished studio paintings. There are also stories um, such as a story from uh, Corot's biographer. There are two paintings by Corot in my group. Corot's biographer wrote that um, he, Corot, uh, had decided to mount some of his landscape sketches, which were painted on paper, onto stretched canvases in order to um, lend them to colleagues and to friends. And also they were given as gifts, so they were sort of collegiate gifts within the artistic community. Um, Another reason is uh, exemplified by Pierre-Henri de Valenciennes, who was a uh, landscape painting teacher at the Academy in Paris, and he mounted his sketches as well um, in order to use them as teaching aids for his students. Um, so um, the status and popularity of landscape sketching began to rise from the late 18th century because they represented several desirable qualities for the artist and the viewer. So one of these desirable qualities was a connection with the old masters because at the time that I'm studying, around 1770s to 1840s, there was a myth that uh, Claude Lorraine in the 17th century had completed entire compositions out in the open air before the subject. And painters like Constable wanted to be more like uh, his hero, uh, Claude. Um, they were also demonstrations of discipline. So paintings like these, this is uh, by Dukin, um, a painting of Corot, um, they needed to be painted in roughly two hours or less if they were to capture the fleeting effects of changing weather conditions. Um, and artists had to therefore focus on broad effects rather than on detail or finish, which I think you can see from this example. This was quite different to the um, focus that they would have had in traditional um, studio works. And another reason why they were felt to be desirable by the artists themselves and by the uh, viewing public is because they, some, some people felt that they represented greater authenticity than paintings that were produced in the studio because they had to produce, be produced so quickly. They um, had little or minimum sort of um, artistic convention could be used. It had to be a individual subjective response to the motif before the artist. This interest in subjectivity was linked to a general social change in the period that blurred the line between public and private, and we see this in other historical uh, changes around the time. Artists blurred, the line, blurred this line by creating finished compositions in the manner, but also using the materials traditionally reserved for private stages of art creation. So um, I'm now just going to talk you through um, in the order of a traditional conservation report. So I'm going to start with talking about the supports of these eight paintings, then the ground layer, so the first preparation layer of the painting, um, followed by the underdrawing and then the final paint layers. But I want to reiterate again that this is a project in progress, so we don't have completely final conclusions yet. So um, I just want to talk about the size of these paintings. So this um, La Chantenieret by Corot is the largest painting in the group and you can see it's only 50 centimetres long so they're quite small paintings and this is shown to scale with the smallest painting in the group which is by uh, Constable the Sky Study. 
There were several reasons why artists preferred to work on this small scale for these types of paintings. Um, obviously, logistically, they were more portable. So these size of objects could be put into the lid of a paint box, for example, to be carried into uh, nature to work on. They also, because they're smaller, they actually just took less time to paint. There's less surface area to work on. Um, and, but there was also another reason that they had, um, because they're smaller, they have an institutional distinction from finished studio paintings that would have been larger. So while sketching was a necessary part of academic training, as I've said before, it also freed artists from the sort of conventions that controlled academic painting for exhibition. The sketch therefore became an area for experimentation and uh, artistic growth. So we see a kind of connection uh, very broadly between the earlier artists in my group, like Le Monnier and Thomas Jones, who were working in the 18th century, through Corot and Constable in the early 19th century, all the way to the beginning of Impressionism in the later 19th century. So uh, of the eight paintings um, that I looked at, two of these paintings were on canvas supports, um, but six of them were on paper. Paper is the most common support for landscape sketching or oil sketching in general, in, from the period of the 17th century when landscape sketching first got its feet and uh, all the way up until the early 19th century, so around 1825. Um, so these are the two works on paper that are not lined. So that means that the other works on paper, the paintings on paper, have been glued down to a secondary support, whether that's a stretched canvas or a solid board or panel. Um, I'm showing these images in raking light, so the light's coming from the side just to show the texture of the surface. You can see this slight kind of buckles and um, creases in the paper. Um, a bit similar to kind of the reasons why artists were working on a small scale, the reasons why artists would choose to work on paper are, are a little bit similar. So practical reasons like the paper is more transportable because it's lighter than, for example, a solid board or panel. Um, it would also have been more versatile, so you can imagine um, if you're out in nature and you want to uh, use a piece of paper of a slightly different size or a different relative uh, ratio of size, you could pick another piece of paper that you've put in your box, or you could even cut the paper when you're actually um, in situ. Like the size of the, of the work, the paper support freed the artist from the constraints of using more formal materials that they would have had if they were working on canvas, for example. In the early part of the period that I'm studying, or that I'm describing today, um, there weren't any papers made specialist for um, artists working in oil paints on paper. Um, this only began in the 19th century. In the early part of the 19th century, French and English colourmen began to advertise paper and boards for sketching, um, but it wasn't until 1850 that paper and boards were specifically designed for working with oil paint. So this gradual change is connected to lots and lots of different reasons, one of which being the expansion of paper making, so paper, uh, the mechanisation of making paper, but also um, it's directly related rather than to the professional market, it's the amateur market that was growing in terms of use of paper, because we actually find that by 1850 professional artists making landscape sketches from nature tended to be working more on canvas than on paper. Um, most of the six works on paper in my group are single sheets of paper. So that's like the Le Monnier. Um, if I just show you here, so this is the back of the Le Monnier, painted in 1779. And uh, you probably can't really tell from this photograph, but it's a uh, coarse, fairly coarse paper uh, made using the laden chain method um, because that was what they used at the time. And it has a very particularly resilient surface. That's what we observed when we had a look at the back. That this is a, probably a paper that was made with some size involved during the process of paper making. And that Le Monnier probably selected this paper because of that resilience, because he wanted to use it not just for writing or for drawing, but for the application of a thick media layer. Um, so I said that most of them were single sheets of paper because the constable in the group is the anomaly here. So um, even though, so constable, this painting was painted in 1822, I think, early, early 1820s. 
And we know from um, other studies of Constable supports that he tended to prefer to work on homemade laminated pasteboards. And this, we think, is an example of that as well. I don't have a photograph of the reverse, but when we had a look at it, it's basically um, two or more sheets of quite um, smooth paper that had been glued together and pressed. But um, Constable actually did this himself rather than buying the boards from a colourman. And there are several reasons why he may have done this, partly possibly because he was concerned with the durability and the sort of resilience of his paper. So when he's going out into uh, Hampstead Heath to make these sky sketches, he wants it to be quite solid, but he doesn't want to pay the price of having to buy a pasteboard from a colourman, so he makes them himself. Um, so most of the, as I said before, I think that most of the group, apart from these two, have been lined onto secondary supports, so onto a canvas or onto a board. And that could have happened at any point during the process of making or after the process of making these artworks. Um, it would make sense that they weren't mounted before they were painted, although pot potentially that could have happened. Um, none of these were done in that way, but um, they would probably have been mounted afterwards, possibly quite soon after, for example, if Corot wanted to give one of these objects, one of these paintings, to a friend or to use it to teach his students. Or sometimes they were mounted by dealers or people later on because a mounted sketch on a stretched canvas elevates the status of that artwork and gives it more consistency with a, a sort of exhibition piece. So these are the two paintings that are on canvas rather than on paper. And they're both from later in the group, so the, the two latest of the group of eight that I'm looking at. By the 1840s, stretched canvas had taken over from paper as the most preferred support by artists for making landscape sketches. This is probably related to the fact that oil studies by this time were becoming increasingly more seen as paintings in their own right, as com complete compositions. Um, rather than being part of the private world of making art, they became more into the public world and they were exhibited and offered for sale. But this came with issues, so canvas as compared with paper as a support is more bulky, more difficult to carry, potentially even if it's unstretched, and if it's stretched onto a stretcher it's, pot it's potentially very difficult to handle in the open air. Um, but also canvas is more expensive. So what I found when I did some analysis uh, using infrared reflectography on these paintings was um, for this painting by Sorensen, which I think I've pronounced wrong, but sorry, um, is that this canvas seems to have been reused. So I'm going to turn the painting over, which may not help anybody, but um, you can see some sort of vertical and horizontal lines in the sky, which is now at the bottom, and uh, there's some, a strange shape in the waves, which I'm going to focus in on now. Um, I don't know if anyone can figure this one out now yet. Yeah. So there's a sort of bust of a person with a face and some hair underneath the waves. And from looking at it in infrared, we can see quite clearly that this has been painted. So this isn't a sketch drawn with just carbon. Um, it's actually been fully painted by the artist. But the other, other parts of the painting have been sketched only in pencil and not fully painted. So for example, this area um, in the infrared you might be able to make out the profile of a dog. So dog, yes, a few nods. Um, so that's been drawn but hasn't been painted in. So Sorensen seems to have used this canvas as a sort of, just a sort of sketching pad. So he's made sketches in different areas of the, of the canvas. So far I haven't found a reason why they're in the same area. So this dog and the bust and the table, I don't know. Um, and some of it has been painted and some of it has just been drawn. So my sort of theory about that is just that he was using this as a sketching pad to sketch out some ideas, but that then he needed a canvas to make a, a completed composition painting of the seascape and decided to reuse a canvas that he'd already used. And it's interesting that this is the only support where I found any reuse, and it's a canvas. So it potentially could be to do with the uh, higher expense that you would pay for a canvas and you wanted to then reuse it. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the ground. So the first, the first preparation layer on top of the paper or canvas support. Um, all of the paper in this group ha does have a ground layer before the paint layer has been applied, although there's been 
published material out there <coughs> saying that some artists work directly onto raw paper without any preparation layer. Artists would have prepared their paper for several reasons, including uh, sort of longevity of the work. So if they had envisaged that they wanted this artwork to last um, into the future as a completed composition, they may have been more concerned about protecting the paper support itself from the oil. So they may have applied then a ground layer to protect it. It would also have made the paper less absorbent, so more like a canvas or panel painting, where you get the uh, maintenance of the glossy surface of the oil paint. Um, but also perhaps possibly the most important reason why they would apply a ground in the earlier part of my period would be to change the colour of the paper. So here we have two examples of brightly coloured grounds. The top photograph is from the Le Monnier painting of the eruption of uh, Vesuvius, and it has a bright red ground, which you can hopefully see at the edges of the grey area. And uh, the bottom picture shows um, the bright blue ground layer of Constable's sky sketch. And both of these artists have used the bright colour of the ground in their final compositions. So it would have helped them to make their painting en plein air in front of the motif more quickly, <coughs> potentially, um, by using the colour of the ground. So I sort of made a rough kind of um, assumption that earlier in the period, before there were papers that were specifically designed for oil paint, these preparations, these ground layers, would have been more likely to, be, to have been applied by the artist. Um, Constable's painting is from later in my period, and he's a bit of an anomaly because he applies his ground to his support, but he also makes his own support. So it's one of the reasons why it's not pre-prepared. Unlike these paintings, uh, so these are both from paintings by Corot, two different ones. Um, generally, the paintings from later in my group, so the 19th century, tend to have lighter coloured grounds and are potentially pre-prepared. So the artist may have bought these papers with a ground layer that had been prepared by a colourman. Uh, we know that by 1840, English and French colourmen were selling pre-grounded papers for work with, with um, paint. Um, Coro, so in... Uh, Examples here, both from Coro, but there are others in the group also with off-white preparations. Um, the, the painters of this sort of period uh, tended to prefer this off-white or white preparations, um, which was potentially similar to actually just the colour of the unprimed paper. And there are various reasons why they preferred that over the brighter colours that we saw earlier in the 18th century. Um, the light ground layer would have meant a more reflective surface um, that they could then uh, work on top of a blank canvas uh, rather than it having already provided some colour. Um, it also potentially has impact on the longevity of the work and it's significant potentially that we see more lighter coloured grounds in the sketches that are later on in the period when artists are thinking more about these artworks as artworks in uh, sort of perpetuity so they're not temporary sketches that they can use for their other works they are sketches that they could then potentially sell so they're maybe more concerned about the uh, upper paint layers becoming more transparent with time and then the ground showing through and darkening the overall colors of the painting so the ground layer being a lighter color is is better for them from that, that point of view um, we see this preference for lighter ground layers or off-white ground layers all the way through to the Impressionists um, who also favoured them. So underdrawing. What I found basically in terms of underdrawing is that there is almost no underdrawing on any of the paintings. The only ones where I did find underdrawing were the two paintings by Corot. Um, this is one of the paintings by Corot painted in Italy and uh, if I you know, just uh, focus in a little bit on two areas you can hopefully see a little bit of um, carbon black underdrawing delineating the edge of the uh, horizon line where you see the, the hills in the bottom picture. And the top picture is uh, from the sky where he's delineated the edges of a, a large cloud. So we see very little underdrawing in general. And where Coro does use the underdrawing, he uses it very quickly and soon proceeds to the application of paint. Um, there's a practical reason why he did this. Um, it would have uh, slowed artists down to have focused too much on the drawing stage. They wanted to proceed straight away to the paint because they would have maybe only had a couple of hours to work on their painting in front of the motif. Uh, 
Of course, of course, it also is possible that I'm not able to detect some of the underdrawings. So that's that's also a possibility. That not necessarily that there aren't any in any of the other examples. So the other paint layers, I'm going to very quickly talk about those. Um, so what's interesting about this period is really about the concepts that the artists had themselves. So I've already talked about how um, Constable was intrigued by this myth that Claude had produced entire paintings in situ in front of uh, the motif and that this spurred him and other artists of the period on to make their own paintings in front of nature. Um, this was part of their own mythology and a mythology they wanted to project also to uh, viewers of their artworks. They wanted people to believe that they had done these objects in one go um, in front of nature. In fact, it wasn't always true. And what I found in some of my analysis is that we see reworkings or later um, layers of paint um, because the oil paint has dried. So the top photograph here shows a, a close-up of the Thomas Jones um, from the uh, 18th century. And um, we see where he has um, applied uh, the green paint to show the kind of um, trees in the middle ground on top of completely dry sky paint. And this is consistent throughout his painting. So this, has been, this painting has been painted over the course of several days, several weeks potentially. Um, I think he's known to have worked sort of in, indoors potentially through a window. So this might explain. It's a bit like doing a sort of en plein air painting but in a studio. Um, the other two paintings are both from La Châtaigneraie by Corot. And the second one, I don't know if it's coming across very well in this picture, but basically there's a fingerprint um, underneath a, the painting of the branch. So the sort of rough lines that you see are the edges of the fingerprint, and that then he has painted the branch over the top. So this fingerprint shows that it, he was handling his, his painting um, after it had dried a little bit, so it wasn't completely wet, but it was wet enough to impress a fingerprint into it but then it's allowed to dry long enough that he can paint a branch over the top that doesn't disturb the paint underneath. So again, we have reworking. And the last photo is from the same painting showing reworking again. So uh, Coro is known to have painted his sky last. Um, he sort of worked from dark to light, supposedly. So he paints in some um, sort of those gray, misty leaves. He paints those first, then paints in the sky paint and he actually paints over these leaves for some reason, decides he doesn't quite want them where he's put them, and then comes back again with the green and puts leaves back, but not in exactly the same place. So none of these layers of paint are on top of wet paint underneath. So he's a this is three at least three campaigns of painting in this area, not probably not on the same day, more likely to be over the course of days or weeks potentially back in the studio. I did, however, find some examples where I... I we can guess that potentially these may have been done all at one go. There's no evidence of wet on dry paint, basically. These photographs of the uh, Sorensen, the um, Coro from Italy, and the Dahl, they all, hopefully you can see that they show the paint um, bleeding into other paint that he's already applied that hasn't allowed to dry. And these, this is the case with all of these paintings. So, um, it's sometimes true, potentially, that artists did make these uh, landscape sketches um, as whole compositions in front of the object within a couple of hours, and sometimes it's more of a myth than the truth. Um, but it did have a huge cachet with other artists, but also with the viewing public, potentially. So artists sometimes wanted to prove that they had done it all in one go. So one way they could do this was to scratch into the wet paint a date or, uh, or their um, signature once they've completed their painting. So this is a close-up of the Coro and the Sorensen where they have scratched into the wet paint their, um, their date to show that they've done it all in one go. And it's a kind of rhetorical thing because they could have easily just painted on top, which is more, more traditional in, in studio paintings. Um, I've just got a picture of the uh, constable there because it's a slight anomaly in that that was not meant to be a whole composition. So we're not viewing it quite the same way as the other paintings. But he did also complete that painting all in one go. And we can see that from this uh, sort of um, indent in the blue paint, which um, was made by a pin. So he painted several uh, paintings on various pieces of paper and then would have put them in his paint box with pins in between to separate them so they didn't stick together when he brought them home. And that's what that's come from. <coughs> 
Um, so in conclusion, I have one minute left. Um, this is a uh, ongoing project. I haven't completed all of the analysis yet, but I'm also hoping to look at more landscape, well, more oil sketches from the Fitzwilliam Museum that may be of different subjects, um, possibly for other uses other than landscape sketching. Um, I've hoped to use, I tried to use different very analytical techniques, but also art historical research to contribute technical information to the exhibition, but also to the catalogue for the Fitzwilliam Museum. My focus has been on the process of making and the decisions of the artist as evidenced by the objects. So um, if anyone is interested in this area or is working on something similar, it'd be really nice to speak to you. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Adele. Finally, this morning, we've got Jennifer Marchants, who will be talking about the opportunities and challenges of documenting conservation. Jennifer is the Conservator of Antiquities at the Fitzwilliam Museum, where she is focused on organic materials, including extensive work on the ancient Egyptian coffin collection. Her research interests include the identification of Egyptian pigments and conservation documentation systems. Okay, um, so uh, the first challenge with uh, a talk on conservation documentation is the availability of interesting images. Uh, <laughs> and the second um, is that by necessity, it involves stealing yourself to wash some dirty linen in public. Um, so I hope you'll be forgiving as I stretch this metaphor um, and I take solace in the fact that um, we've at least separated our colours and got the wash on, even if the laundry isn't quite ready to dry. So I'm going to discuss today, um, first of all, um, why I became interested in documentation, um, some of the history of the development of conservation documentation within the UK, um, what makes documentation important, some of the challenges that we have at the Fitzwilliam Museum, um, and how we're starting to address these issues, um, and how we hope to be able to achieve um, what we hope to be able to achieve through better systems. Because of my work at the Fitzwilliam Museum, I'm mostly going to be focusing um, on conservation documentation practices within an institutional setting. So, why am I interested? Oh, sorry. Why am I interested in conservation documentation? So prior to working in conservation, I worked as a field archaeologist. Um, and in many ways, um, the records that are produced by um, archaeologists are actually the most important elements of their work. And it's well recognised that um, the intrinsically destructive nature of excavation means that context and historical value for a site or an object is very much focused on these records. Um, in the field of commercial archaeology, archaeological reporting is overseen by local authorities um, and through them there's the broader national oversight of historic England. Um, this means that there's quite a lot of consistency in practice and in fact many local authorities use the same database. These databases have very stringent thesaurus control um, and we have um, Places like the Archaeological Data Service, a digital res re repository sorry, <laughs> um, for heritage data um, that's firmly focused on the long-term preservation of digital records. When I came to work in museums, I was actually quite surprised to find that the uh, underfunded and slightly chaotic world of archaeology um, was actually quite advanced in terms of its documentation practice, um, and in particular, um, digital documentation. And I think this is probably actually in no small part due to the overarching control from, in, from historic England. Um, but it also might be um, that there's a greater object focus on, in museums um, rather than sort of looking at the broader context, although that has become much more established over time. So my first instinct um, when questioning how to record my conservation work um, was to look for sectoral standards um, and guidance on conservation documentation. 
And it was um, with a, a hopeful and expectant mindset that I downloaded the then current Spectrum standard. Um, but I, I have to say, I was slightly disappointed. Um, although it, there's much in the way of really good um, procedural information, um, it lacked the consideration of, of what records should actually look like um, that I'd been hoping for. In retrospect, um, I can see that actually this is likely to have been a deliberate decision um, to take into account um, the fact that many museum documentation systems have developed in a very individual capacity and that there's considerable disagreement on what the correct way to record conservation data is. Um, so I just want to pause at this point um, to think about what conservation documentation consists of. At its narrowest form, um, it's the records and images um, of the conservation and condition of an object, along with descriptions of treatment method, methods and materials. We can also bring collections care data into the picture and looking at environmental data, including relative humidity, temperature and light exposure. And we can also think about the recording of general storage conditions and packaging and display materials. We then start to get into the slightly um, fuzzy distinction between conservation documentation and the documentation of conservation science. Um, technical studies of materials and technology um, are well within the remit of many conservators um, as they're carrying out close physical examination of objects. Um, but not all conservators will be going into the realms of um, the more analytical data. At the Fitzwilliam Museum, um, we sit somewhere on this line, um, and some conservators are carrying out technical imaging and analysis, um, whilst uh, then bowing to the expertise of conservation scientists for other techniques. Um, and this leaves us with a wide range of records that we deal with. Uh, really, these are just so that I can have some pictures of objects in my talk. Um, so we have um, X-radiography, digital imaging, um, so we've got infrared ref reflectography at the top. Um, we also end up with a variety of spectra um, and other analytical data alongside the more traditional conservation records. So, going back to um, early documentation schemes, um, systems like Spectrum that have looked at producing sectoral guidance uh, for documentation have been in development for many years. Uh, the Museum Documentation Association, now the Collections Trust, was formed in, the, in early 1977 um, and grew out of work to improve standards. And some of this work I was interested to discover as I was writing this talk um, was actually carried out um, by the Sedgwick Museum in Cambridge. Um, the focus at this point um, was on producing digital records and there was much excitement about the potential for databases. I don't know that we necessarily have much excitement about databases these days, but there was. Um, <laughs> And this work focused um, really on general um, collections management systems. So what was the conservation sector documenting at the same time? Um, there appears to have been um, very little in the way of comprehensive conservation documentation um, until around the 1970s and 80s. Um, and even then, um, it was actually mostly paper records um, that were being produced. And this is certainly true of the Fitzwilliam Museum, um, where prior to the 1980s, the most that could be hoped for in terms of conservation records um, was often the, um, the odd handwritten note in the margins of collections records um, or occasional mentions in the museum syndicate report. Prior to this, um, conservation treatments were recorded in journals um, but this was an occasional practice rather than the intention to record all treatments. So before we 
get into the, the nitty gritty of the conservation records at the museum, I also wanted to discuss briefly um, why I believe that we should be thinking about conservation documentation um, and how we can develop it. One of the key tenets um, of modern conservation is that conservators should document the condition and treatments of the objects in their care. And this is referred to in the Institute of Conservation's pack of professional standards, along with several other international codes of practice for conservators. Documentation allows others to understand and learn from previous work. Um, it means that as a profession, um, we can assess the long-term effectiveness of treatments and materials and it ensures that our own treatments can't be mistaken for part of the original object. It can reduce the need for new invasive sampling um, and it can reduce handling of material and therefore increase the long-term preservation of our collections. In short, um, documentation is a key element to the ethical treatment of heritage materials and it's a major component of what sets us apart from the men that fixed things um, that came before us. Um, but there are some problems with current documentation practice um, and conservation documentation as it currently exists um, needs some thought and improvement. Um, individual conservators are often making decisions and changes um, in their practice in isolation um, and while there is really good work um, being done out there in different institutions and in private practices, um, the, the, this, this um, individual focus can lead to duplication of effort um, and actually to a lack of consistency across the sector. Um, and this makes it difficult to share knowledge um, at a time when digital systems should increasingly be allowing us to integrate um, our working practices. Um, the ICON Documentation Network um, was established in um, 2013 um, and this is uh, a network that was set up um, by a small number of individual ICON members who had um, a shared desire for some more clarity and consistency in documentation practice. Um, I've been in, involved in the group um, from the start and although at times it's been slightly slow going, um, it's been a useful forum to discuss issues in conservation documentation um, and I fed this into my work at the museum. So we're now going to turn to um, some of the specific issues um, that we have uh, with our conservation documentation at the museum. We hold um, a reasonable amount of legacy conservation records in hard copy um, as I'm sure most institutions do. Um, and within these records, there's quite a lot of variation in format. Um, we have some handwritten notes, um, some handwritten but on pro forma sheets. Um, we have also records with tick boxes, um, typewritten reports, sketches, overlays, paper readouts from old thermohygrographs, um, and as you can see, many drawers of slides. Um, there are some digitally produced reports that are printed and filed, um, and the re resultant paper reports are sometimes a precise copy of the digital files, but may have additional notes um, or hand annotated images with them. And this is particularly true of our condition reports that have been produced for loans. Um, and because the conservation at the museum is split by curatorial department, we also see um, variation across cu um, curatorial specialisms within the conservation records. So beyond our paper records, um, we hold a large number of digital reports um, some of which have fairly consistent formats, um, but others have some variation. Um, what's common, though, um, is that actually the vast majority have long free text sections. And this is really useful in some ways for explaining the reasons 
um, behind treatments and for giving detailed descriptions of the methodology um, so that a treatment can be you know, reworked in the future. Um, but it makes integration with um, some digital systems a bit more challenging. Um, the exceptions to this are probably really mostly where we hold Excel spreadsheets and access databases um, with condition survey data um, from subsets of the collection. Um, there is a, a conservation section to our internal collections management data um, system, AdLib, um, but this really hasn't been um, utilised um, very significantly at all at the museum um, up until now. There's been, at, since I've been at, at the museum, there have been semi-regular discussions of whether or not we'll be carrying on using AdLib. And I think actually that's fed into um, the sort of lack of commitment, perhaps, to getting involved in the work that is really needed to reshape this database and make it practical for the use of storing conservation data. So um, in 2016, um, I carried out an initial survey of the conservation documentation systems at the museum to get a sense of the scale of our challenges um, and to identify where we have areas of good practice that can then be rolled out across the museum as a whole. Um, this was done in part um, due to the feeling that I had that um, rather than working within a clearly defined um, documentation system, I was actually felt like I was continuing to create backlog um, um, so that this conservation data would then need to be reassessed in the future um, and reshaped to, to make it into a useful long-term um, system. Um, the digital records, um, as well as the older paper ones, um, were still being created um, in forms that actually made accessing much of the data quite difficult. For example, there is no way to easily identify what conservation treatments or materials have been used without having some memory of when the treatment occurred. Um, otherwise, you're left often um, with just browsing through records, looking for similar objects um, and hoping that you might find something useful. Um, so loan data is also difficult to access, um, as many of our condition reports um, have been filed by the date and location of the loan rather than the loan, the object numbers that actually went on that particular loan. Um, and this can be quite frustrating. Um, it's not true of all of the data, um, but there's definitely an element of, of, of that material that, uh, that has been filed in that way. And really this gives us a heavy reliance on individual staff memory. Um, and leads to a serious risk of data loss um, as staff retire or leave for other jobs. Um, so um, my work looking at the conservation data was carried out in parallel um, with a museum-wide reassessment of some of our digital resources, uh, and in particular the images that are taken by our photographers. Um, and these are largely held on separate servers that conservators and curators don't have access to. Um, we had a some um, well a fairly major setback really in this part of the work um, when we lost uh, staff in IT and documentation, um, but with some new staff in posts and other roles hopefully to be filled soon, um, this could be an area of work that is due to be revisited. So this, this difficulty of accessing data um, between different um, parts of the museum um, was actually something that I saw in our conservation records as well. So we have um, records that are used by conservators and those that are used by curators and sometimes it actually isn't, either, either they don't know about each other's records or it isn't actually possible to access those parts of the database of the um, 
not the database, the uh, file system. Um, so this causes quite a lot of difficulty sharing data and this can be true within and between um, curatorial departments. And it, it really is a limiting factor um, for the full understanding of our collection and makes research much harder than it needs to be. Um, other challenges that uh, were identified um, were the fact that uh, existing conservation documentation systems um, aren't fully defined um, within the museum. Um, there's, there's no um, outline of what a minimum record um, should consist of. Um, and sometimes we have slightly inconsistent um, file naming conventions. Um, it's not to say that no conventions or systems exist, um, and there, but there are pockets of internally consistent systems and they don't run across the museum as a whole. Um, developing file naming conventions is actually one of the more straightforward things um, that we can be doing to improve our work and it's something that I hope to continue to work on on this coming year. We also need to be focusing more on how to file our digital records to enable future retrieval. Um, and there are again pockets of different systems in place, um, and, but there is often a, a strong tendency for data to be filed within project folders. Um, which again requires you to know when something was worked on to be able to access those records. Um, currently, um, it's quite difficult to associate our environmental data with our object records. Um, and I think this is something that, um, along with um, Helena Rodwell, our collections care conservator, um, I'd like to be doing some more work on in the near future to think about how we can and tie those records together better. Um, a, strong, a strong theme that sort of came out of um, going around and talking to conservators about how they um, carried out their documentation um, was the time, pressures on time um, for conservators and technicians and how this impacts on their record production. Um, this is particularly acute in departments where there's a heavy loan or exhibition schedule. Um, so looking at ways to, um, to simplify um, systems would be a really effective way to actually make it uh, possible to kind of get the most out of the records that we are producing. Um, and an interesting additional challenge um, in two departments of the museum um, manuscripts and printed books and um, Hamilton Carr Institute is that the conservators are actually carrying out um, a sig significant amounts of external conservation work and this puts slightly different requirements um, on the form that conservation um, reports need to take um, due to them being effectively client focused rather than focused on um, the needs of conservators and curators. Um, and I think this is something that we need to explore more um, as we go forward. It's also clear that um, more and more we're going to be increasing the amounts of scientific data um, that we're producing and holding. Um, and really this is something that's only going to escalate in the future. So it's quite a long list of, uh, <laughs> of things that we, we want to be looking at. Um, but I think it I think it is always easier to find um, find the snags um, than to identify um, other things. But I was really pleased that uh, actually there are some really good areas of good practice that relatively straightforwardly we can um, roll across the museum. Um, we I saw that uh, I mean the Hamilton Car Institute in particular has very good guidance on the reporting systems that they use. I think probably because they have quite a high turnover of um, interns coming through, so they've really focused on that. Um, and they have systems in place for checking their images and their naming. Um, and across the museum, actually, a lot of the historic paper records um, are actually very well ordered, quite logical, quite easy to find what you're looking for. Um, although uh, much of it hasn't been digitised, um, if, if you know which filing cabinet to go to, you can find the records you're looking for. Um, 
We also have um, seen that uh, in collections care department, there's been a good system set up um, for dating and author, um, authoring reports. Um, and this has worked very well for um, understanding at what point these, these sorts of reports pr were produced um, and getting that sort of consistency um, within their records. Um, all departments have at least some areas where their digital um, reports are clearly filed by accession number. Um, and um, PDFing um, of finished reports and then adding sort of additional PDF addendums has worked really well, particularly with the scientific reporting. Um, where we have um, the accession number used in file and folder names, um, it's actually relatively easy to access the data. And that's something that I think a lot of um, computer systems will be able to pick up on even, um, when we, we come to sort of do further work to gather this information together. So we've got these, oh, these key challenges um, for making improvements to the conservation um, documentation, um, and one of which is certainly resourcing, um, having the time and the staff to do um, quite a lot of back, um, backlog work, but also thinking really seriously about the systems that we put in place so that we know that they're, they're, they'll be fit for future work. Um, we also, and our challenge is also really um, the fact that we need to collaborate across multiple departments. Um, so really getting sort of maximum buy-in into any changes um, so that uh, people don't feel like they're being in, it's being imposed upon them and so that people will be more likely to um, want to shift away and come to a, a new system. So looking to the future, um, I'm going to be looking, hopefully, to be um, delivering and collaborating on the development of guidelines and templates um, and procedures for conservation scientific research um, that can be um, implemented across the museum um, in the coming year. Um, new systems need to be consistent as possible across the museum. Um, although naturally all types of objects don't lend themselves to the same types of recording. And these systems really need to be sensitive to the time pressures um, and designed to minimise time wherever possible. Um, and this will just make actually make their uptake um, in departments much more likely. So um, <clears throat> legacy paperwork is also a major resourcing challenge. And I think actually this is probably going to be um, something to be looked at in a later phase of work. Um, but one of the simple things that I've been doing to chip away at some of, this, um, some of these records is actually arranging for people to list what, are in, what papers are in file and cabinets so that we can have a, a digital list that can then ultimately be connected to any database resources so that we can find out what's in a cupboard without having to go and physically flip through the files. Um, so AdLib's still a bit of a question mark for me, um, whether or not it's the best um, system to put um, our digital data. Um, I've been following with interest um, the sort of long, slow development of a piece of software called Conservation Space. Um, and this was developed out of two community design workshops organised by the Andrew Mellon Foundation in 2009. Um, but it wasn't until this year that the software was rolled out at the National Gallery of Art Washington and the Courtauld Institute of Art. Um, so I think this is something to be watching, um, to be um, looking at and, and seeing whether or not um, this is a direction that we want to be looking to go into um, in the future. Um, so, looking at the future of documentation for us at the Fitzwilliam, um, we've got quite a lot of challenges to work through, um, but really what keeps um, me motivated is the potential for improving the efficiency of our working practices um, so that we can actually maximise the amount of time that we're spending um, actually doing conservation rather than writing about conservation. Um, 
but and then we can take this information um, and and be able to share it um, internally, um, nationally and internationally. And it's with this in mind um, that I've just agreed um, to collaborate um, on a AHRC grant um, that Oxford University and Stanford are putting in to build a UK-US network um, investigating potential for linked data in conservation. And hopefully um, I, this can be built into um, the work that I'll be doing at the Fitzwilliam on the more practical side of our documentation. So, back to the laundry. Um, we, yes, we, we, we are very much a work in progress um, and hopefully uh, we'll get the wash out on the line soon. Um, but I think what we need to bear in mind with all of this work, um, and I think this is reflected in the constant changes um, in conservation documentation that have occurred, um, is that actually, uh, like the washing, um, conservation documentation systems um, they'll be they'll get dirty again and we'll have to <laughs> pop them back in the wash um, so we can look forward to that in the future